to throw in the towel and give up on on Richard Balcom. But I was tempted to do just that, as a matter of fact. I, I was tempted to take Jesus and the eyewitnesses after six chapters and throw in the towel and to say, I can't do this anymore. These Christian apologetics, even the most scholarly of the lot, is beating me to a pulp. I, I can't take it anymore. But, you know, after a couple of weeks, my, my wife uh, stuck my head into some ice cold water, gave me a couple of swift backhands, you know, shoved some smelling salts under my nose. And so I'm back in it, baby. I'm back for the long haul. I am committed. I am going to finish <laughs> one way or another uh, my, uh, my book discussion, my review of Richard Baucom's apologetic magnum opus jesus and the eyewitnesses but before i continue with uh, chapter seven i've got a major announcement to make i i looked on my youtube feed for the first time in a couple of weeks and what do you know i've had a massive surge in uh subscribers in the last uh few days or so and so i have hit a major milestone and so I have, after five years of being on YouTube, I have finally passed 147 subscribers. I, I, I couldn't be prouder, let me tell you. What people want to, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm sorry, I don't show my face, uh, but I've got my dignity to maintain. The only thing you've got to look forward to in the way of entertainment is me throwing my arms around. That That's it. That's all you're getting. I know nothing about video production. Uh, this this stupid slide that I'm showing you, it took me like half an hour to make. It, it was just a royal pain. I, I, I don't know anything about this stuff. I don't get it. I don't know what the heck I'm doing here. So for those of you who are interested in Christian apologetics and book discussions and book reviews and for uh, sticking around to the end of these hour-long videos, uh, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. So, yeah, with that said, let's jump right on into chapter 7. I'm <clears throat> I'm going to apologize up front. Uh, this chapter was deathly, dull, dead, dirt, boring. And it, this, this chapter 7 has so far been the most boring chapter of this book, and there's no way I can make it very interesting for you. So, uh, sneak preview... Uh, <laughs> I'm still not convinced of anything. You can end the video now. For those of you who want a little bit more detail and a little more pain uh, and some uh, sleep inducement, stick around. So, chapter seven is called The Petrine Perspective in the Gospel of Mark. So, as a reminder, the previous chapter, Richard Balcom argued uh, very um, uh, with, with massive contrivance that there is this... Uh, um, literary device that the evangelist Mark utilized to indicate that his gospel is reliant on the eyewitness testimony of the apostle Peter, and that literary device is called the inclusio. So, uh, still not convinced, um, uh, <laughs> uh, Balcom is now going to continue this theme that the gospel of Mark is dependent on uh, the eyewitness uh, testimony of the Apostle Peter. So he's done with, the, well, he's he's mostly done with the inclusio. It will make a comeback uh, from the grave, but uh, he's going to um, argue that Peter was the primary source of eyewitness testimony with another te uh, grammatical technique. And this is sort of the problem that he's going to come against because Richard Balcom is going to build his case for, on, uh, of Petrine, uh, the Petrine perspective in chapter 7. He's going to build this case on the foundation he laid in chapter 6, the Inclusio device. And I didn't find that remotely convincing, but chapter seven, you know, relies on that foundation. So that's kind of the danger that Richard Balcom is running into. It's that I didn't find his 
his uh, previous arguments at all convincing, and then everything subsequent to that, however, relies on those arguments that he, you know, that foundation that he laid. If I don't find them convincing, nothing else is going to follow from it. That's maybe that's why I found this chapter so so boring. I don't know. So here's how Balcom uh, opens chapter seven on page one hundred fifty five. He says, we have seen that Mark's gospel has the highest frequency of reference to Peter among the gospels and that it uses the inclusio of eyewitness testimony to indicate that Peter was its main eyewitness source. Well, there you go. That's the foundation that he lays. And both of those arguments I didn't find remotely convincing. Mark, uh, John's gospel is the one who mentions Peter the most which Balcom conveniently ignored, and the inclusio of eyewitness testimony that Balcom argued for in chapter 6, I found to be preposterous. Uh, if you want reasons why I thought that, go to my previous videos. But this is the foundation that he lays, and he's going to build on it. I'm not going to be convinced um, of anything in chapter 7, because I found chapter 6 to be wholly implausible. Anyway, Balcom continues... Can we go further than this on the internal evidence of the gospel itself in detecting features that relate it closely to Peter? Is there any sense in which the stories are told from a Petrine perspective? Does Peter have an individual significance within the narrative, or is he merely representative of the disciples of Jesus in general? And that's Richard Balcom. That's how he opens chapter 7 on uh, page 155 and so he asks that question and of, and of course the answer is going to be of course uh, otherwise you wouldn't have written the chapter of course there's a way that uh, he thinks that the evangelist mark is uh, going to uh, use some grammatical internal device uh, to indicate who his source of eyewitness testimony is never mind that the evangelist never says anything he, he could have easily said uh, I, I got the source of this information from the, from the Apostle Peter or something like that. Could have easily done that. And Balcom himself shows that other contemporary but secular sources uh, do in fact do that. They name their sources uh, of, of information. Um, but the evangelist Mark does that. Therefore, Balcom has to write chapter after chapter uh, uh, arguing that there are grammatical techniques that Mark used to point to who the source of eyewitness information is. You know, all of these chapters wouldn't be necessary. All Mark has to do is just say it, and it would be done. No argument necessary. The, and, and me, who is taking the, uh, the historicity of the Gospel of Mark for granted, I'm, I'm taking the historical, it, it as, a, as history. I'm taking the Christian side on this. But since the evangelist Mark never says anything, uh, Balcom has to make his case with grammatical techniques. Balcom is forced to use tricks and techniques like this that he has to hunt for in the Gospel of Mark. Let me give you a sneak preview uh, really quick, just an example of really what this chapter uh, seven is all about. What Richard Balcom does is he's going to use a trick of grammar. Here's an example. Uh, this is Mark chapter six, verses seven through 10. And this is where he's uh, calling disciples to be evangelists and he's going to send them out and he's giving them uh, marching orders. Okay. So who is the historical reference for this story? as told to us by the evangelist Mark. Well, Balcom, Balcom argues that essentially what is happening here is this is a more or less verbatim story uh, that the evangelist Mark heard from the apostle Peter. And we know this because if you take, for instance, Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, and change a few pronouns from third or second person to first person, 
then we can get what the apostle actually said verbatim as the source of eyewitness testimony, what he said to the evangelist Mark. So I'm not going to read it, but basically here is Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. But what the evan this is what the evangelist Mark wrote. But what the evangelist Mark actually heard was this. <laughs> See, you just change a few pronouns to uh, from third person to first person, and you're done. This is what the evangelist Mark heard from presumably the apostle Peter. And he called us to himself and began to send us out two by two. And he gave us power over unclean spirits. And he commanded us to take nothing for our journey, etc., etc. You get the idea. This is basically what chapter 7 boils down to. <laughs> um, now, I, I don't want to ridicule it because Balcom... I, I don't want to set up a straw man. I should say it like that. Because Balcom, Balcom understands that you can't just take a piece of text and change pronouns around to make it first person. Bam, done. We've got eyewitness testimony. We have evidence of eyewitness testimony. This is something that, I, if I remember correctly, an old book by F.F. F. Bruce uh, did this very same thing. Uh, to show that there was evidence that Peter uh, did this. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce is not cited in Richard Balcom, but I do remember reading that a long time ago. Really, you can't get away with this. And the, the reason being is you can take pretty much any text uh, from the Bible or elsewhere and do the same trick and arbitrarily make it a first-person account. For instance, I just grabbed something at random. Here's something, for instance, from 1 Kings chapter 10. This is uh, the report of the Queen of Sheba coming to um, praise Solomon and his, uh, you know, admire his temple, things like that. Nobody knows who wrote 1 Kings from the Old Testament. Nobody knows. Even fundamentalist Christians will say, will admit, nobody knows who wrote this. And doesn't matter. We can easily change a text like this to make it a first-person account from the Queen of Sheba herself. All you got to do is change a few pronouns around and you can make it say, um, When I came to test him with hard questions, I came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue with camels that bore spices. Uh, I came to Solomon and I spoke with him about etc. etc. You can easily do this. Um, and, you know, I, I, for fun, I grabbed a few random things out of, for instance, the Book of Mormon did the same thing. I'm not going to show it because it's, it's dirt easy. It's trivial. And I think that's the problem that Richard Balcom runs into. He understands that just changing pronouns around in the Gospel of Mark to make it an eyewitness uh, uh, the result of an eyewitness source from the Apostle Peter is just too easy because you can do it with anything. I think that's the problem he runs into. So what Richard Balcom does is he's got to kind of give it rules. There, there are no rules to this. You're just changing pronouns around. So what Balcom does is he attempts to create rules uh, to give it some kind of structure that he can play with. So what Balcom does is he comes up with this thing called the plural to singular narrative device. Here's what he, basically what it is, is that Balcom notices that there are pronouns that in the Gospel of Mark that quickly change from plural to a, from a plural pronoun to a singular pronoun. And because this is kind of clunky grammar and clumsy it stands out, uh, and there must be a reason why this technique is used. Okay, so here's what Balcom says uh, on page 156. Uh, 21 passages in the Gospel of Mark in which at least one plural verb without an explicit subject 
is used to describe the movements of Jesus and his disciples, followed immediately by a singular verb or pronoun, referring to Jesus alone. On page 157, he continues, Compare the usage of Matthew and Luke in parallel passages. In some cases, there is no parallel to the Markan passage at all, or the particular clause containing the plural verb or verbs is dropped by Matthew and or Luke. From page 157. So, again, Balcom <laughs> is again uh, assuming that uh, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke are basing their information off the Gospel of Mark, which again, I'm not sure all <laughs> fundamentalists are going to be comfortable with and kind of, uh, you know, he's, he's saying basically that the Gospel of Mark is the one that is primarily the result of uh, an eyewitness uh, source testimony. Uh, putting that aside, uh, here is an example of what Richard Balcom is talking about. Uh, from, for instance, from Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when he had stepped out of the boat, etc. So you see that it switches from a plural pronoun, they, meaning Jesus and his disciples, to a singular pronoun, pronoun he, meaning Jesus alone. Here's another example from Mark chapter 11, verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Again, they referring to Jesus and his disciples, and he referring to Jesus alone. So, Balcom says that this is a very clumsy, clunky way of of, of writing. It's, it's peculiar grammar. It, it's, it's ambiguous, perhaps. Uh, there's some question as who they is actually referring to. Things like that make it stand out. Hmm, is the evangelist Mark doing this for a particular reason? Well, of course, Richard Balcom says this must be investigated. What if... <laughs> What if the pronoun, the plural pronoun, is changed to not a uh, singular, but to a plural first person pronoun? You know, you know what if? So, um, Balcom continues on page 158. The Markan third person plurals in these passages were modifications of a first person plural used by an eyewitness to whom the plural came natural as being himself an actor in the events he relates. If we is substituted for they in these passages, well, they read more naturally, since a distinction between first and third person is then added to the difference between plural and singular. I'm not quite sure what that means, I, I must admit. Um, <laughs> regardless, Balcom claims that changing the pronoun from uh, first person or third person to first person makes the passage read more naturally. Never mind that the plural to singular narrative device is still there. But I guess to correct for that, we can just just as easily, if we can change it from third person to first person, I guess we can change the plural to sing uh, the plural and change it to singular just as easily. Uh, why? Why not? So, uh, Balcom gives further evidence, or kind of shows a, 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 another peculiar feature that might perhaps give evidence that this is an intentional, this grammatical clumsiness is something that is put in by the evangelist Mark intentionally. And that is that when the evangelists Luke and Matthew, who copy Mark, when they um, have uh, parallel passages, they 
correct the Markan passage and give it more correct grammar. Here's what Baucom has to say about this on page 164. Referring to the plural to singular narrative device, we should recall that in the Gospels it is an unusual device, used independently of Mark only twice in Luke, and a device that, in many cases, both the other synoptic evangelists and the scribes evidently felt to be inappropriate. It is out of the ordinary, and therefore requires an explanation adequate to that fact. Malcolm also says on page 157, this characteristic of Mark's narrative appears much more striking when we compare the usage of Matthew and Luke in parallel passages. That's because, according to Baucom, uh, Matthew and Luke are correcting Mark's clunky grammar. Um, however, you know, so Baucom's saying we have to explain this clunky grammar that Mark is using. What could it possibly mean? And the conclusion he comes to is, well, if we take this clunky grammar, change the pronouns in it from hmm, third person to first person, there you go. There's our eyewitness testimony. And um, hey, it points right to Peter the Apostle. There you go. That's what Richard Balcom is driving at. And that is basically this uh, entire chapter seven in a nutshell. Hey, don't blame me. I'm just the messenger. So here is a table at the end of chapter 7 that catalogs all of the occurrences in the Gospel of Mark of this plural to singular narrative device. Um, in the cases where the pronoun is plural, Balcom also indicates when there are variant readings that in the Gospel of Mark that make it singular, and he also shows parallel accounts in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke as to whether that parallel account is also plural or whether it in turn is, is turned into a singular account. So Baucom is running with this idea that the Gospels of, that this, this narrative structure in the Gospel of Mark is peculiar, unusual, and the fact that the Gospels of Matthew and Luke are correcting the, the, the peculiar grammar um, requires a explanation. Um, and Balcom says that this demands a explanation. So again, here's the first part of this uh, table. I can't fit the entire thing on one slide, but take a look. Balcom is claiming that the evangelists Matthew and Luke are correcting Mark, but if you look at this table where this narrative structure occurs, there are still a lot of cases where there are no parallel accounts in Matthew and Luke, and there are also occurrences where if Mark is plural, so are the parallel accounts. In fact, where there is no correction. So not all of these cases, you know, what were there, 21, 22 cases uh, in the Gospel of Mark where Balcom notices this? But in not, in, in, all, in not all of these cases is there a correction that Balcom describes. So I put a big red line <laughs> through those occurrences that just don't apply. So here's the first part of the table. I've struck out six occurrences right there because there are no correction. And I'm not going to consider variant reading. That's, that's beyond the scope of what I'm willing to do. I'm not going to consider variant readings in the Gospel of Mark. I'll just look at parallel accounts in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. So this is the first part of the table. Let's look at the second part of the table. There are many more occurrences in the Gospel of Mark, um, but many also that don't apply because Matthew and Luke don't correct it. And I've drawn lines through those. Therefore, there are no explanations to be had in many of these. So in total, I believe I've counted nine actual occurrences where there is a plural to singular narrative device in the Gospel of Mark uh, 
And then parallel accounts of Matthew and Luke is claimed by Balcom to change the plural to singular. Um, so it's my duty to now slog through <laughs> all of these occurrences that Balcom is saying this narrative device occurs and let's take a little closer look at them, shall we? So here's how we're going to proceed. Here's the first uh, occurrence of this peculiar uh, narrative device from Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. So there you go. There's the plural, they. The singular is he. Now, I think that it's important to make some kind of distinction about who these pronouns are applying to. That means that in order to do this, we must look at what immediately precedes uh, this passage. In this case, when you read uh, what precedes uh, this in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20, it be, uh, this is the story of the call of the disciples. It becomes apparent that they, the pronoun they, refers to Jesus and the disciples, and he refers to Jesus. But the only way you do this is by looking at the context of what comes immediately before. Okay, let's look at the parallel account that Richard Balcom is stating is the Gospel of Luke correcting clunky grammar from the Gospel of Mark. The parallel account of the Gospel of Luke is from chapter 4, verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. But you notice that there's no singular here. The pronoun they in the Gospel of Mark is not corrected. It's just removed. Changing the pronoun in this case is not a correction of the grammar. It's a function of a different preceding story. This is preceded by Jesus' rejection at the Gospel of Nazareth, not the call of the disciples as is the case in the Gospel of Mark. So we have no correction of grammar. It's just a different story that is preceding the Gospel of Luke than what you have in the Gospel of Mark. Richard Balcom wants us to think that the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 21, is with respect to Peter. Fine. He has to explain how Peter is absent in Luke chapter 4, verse 31, which he is. He hasn't been called yet until Luke chapter 4, verse 38. So if this is with respect to Peter, Richard Balcom has to explain why Peter is not yet called in the parallel account of the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, verse 31. There's no correction of grammar here. It's a completely different story. So that's the first one, and you can see where this is going um, <laughs> already. Um, Richard Balcom claims that the, the parallel accounts are a correction of Mark's clunky grammar. And we've already seen on the very first case, this is not necessarily true. Uh, we've just got different stories and different uh, people that the pronouns are pointing to. Let's look at the next case. Uh, this is Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. Okay, Simon's wife's mother. Hey, Simon is the person who is the major uh, source of eyewitness testimony for the Gospel of Mark. So um, why this is the perfect opportunity for the Gospel of Mark to say such. Um, but 
you know, it, it would rather use uh, narrative devices and inclusios to do this um, that have to be interpreted like cipher code. Go figure. Anyway, what is this story immediately preceded by? It is immediately preceded by the story of Jesus casting out an unclean spirit. When you read that story, then it's a, it becomes apparent that they, uh, the pronoun they, refers to Jesus and the disciples. But I must admit, at least in English, I don't know what it's like in Greek, but at least in English, this is really clumsily written. It's, it's really poor grammar. And the singular him refers to Jesus. Uh, the parallel account in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 38, is very, very, very similar. It also is preceded by uh, Jesus, the story of Jesus casting out an unclean spirit. But again, there is no plural pronoun they. It's just removed completely. There's no actual correction of the pronoun. There's no singular here at all. It's, as, as Balcom says, the pronoun is just removed. It's he arose from the synagogue. Uh, he referring to Jesus. Okay, let's look at the parallel account in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 14. Uh, it says, Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with fever, etc. So, no pronoun is used here. Um, the pronouns are completely removed, and now it, he is replaced by Jesus. You know, the, the, the personal pronouns are used in this case. Well, this story is, in the Gospel of Matthew, is not preceded by the story of uh, Jesus casting out an unclean spirit, like it is in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. No, in the Gospel of Matthew, this story is preceded by the story of Jesus healing the centurion's servant. Completely different. So what if the Gospel of Matthew used pronouns and 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 uh, even corrected the pronoun into a, a singular form, as Richard Balcom says he does? Well, in this case, if, if Matthew was to do that, then if the pronoun he is used, well, it would refer to the centurion's servant, uh, which is completely different from the Gospel of Mark and Luke. Um, if the pronoun they is used, it would refer to Jesus, the centurion, and the servant. It would be a completely, it would be, it would be ridiculous to use pronouns in this case because it would refer to things that, that don't make sense. Mark is correct in removing the pronouns altogether and replacing them with personal pronouns so it becomes explicit who, G, who, uh, who is being referred to. It's Jesus. So in this case, it's not, it, it's admittedly very clumsy grammar. Uh, Mark is using very clunky grammar, admittedly so. And um, I, it looks like the Gospel of Luke really is doing a legitimate clarification of the Gospel of Mark, but the Gospel of Matthew has a completely different story preceding this one. It doesn't look like he's, he's correcting anything. There's no clarification at, uh, needed at all. Matthew just puts a completely different story at the front end of this and makes the, the pronouns uh, uh, irrelevant. So again, it's if, if a case is to be made, I'm going to tell you up front right now, uh, here's a sneak preview. If a case is to be made of Balcom's argument that Luke and Matthew are correcting clunky grammar from the Gospel of Mark, this is the best case he's got. In fact, this is the only case he's got. One instance. One instance. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's referring to the uh, major source of eyewitness testimony being, you know, uh, Simon uh, going to his mother-in-law's house. And it, the perfect opportunity to identify this guy, this guy as the source of information is passed right over. But this is the best, uh, the, the best case that Balcom has 
Uh, we're going to go through about six more of these, if I can stomach it, and none of these are any better. This is the best and only case that Balcom has uh, in, in favor of his argument. So, I, you know, on second thought, I better not go through all of these. Because I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm over 35 minutes into this video. I, those 147 subscribers that I worked so hard to get, I can, I can feel them clicking the unsubscribe, you know, by the second. So I think I better end it here. Uh, I'll go through these slides really quick and just show that, that some of the other cases just really quick. I mean, there's Mark chapter five verses one through two. Um, yeah, there, that's the uh, story of, uh, the, uh, the the demon possessed guy the uh, living in the gergazines or the gatherings. Uh, there's uh, Mark chapter ten where again the parallel account of Matthew doesn't change the uh, pronouns at all. He changes them to first uh, to uh, personal pronouns. Just puts people's names in there. Uh, there's um, Mark chapter ten and uh, Matthew chapter twenty which are the same. That's um, uh, the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Uh, Luke just Luke does change the pronoun to first person, but uh, doing it doesn't make Mark chapter ten a first person account. Um, and and Luke also changes the itinerary. Uh, one has uh, Mark has uh, Jesus going out of Jericho. Luke has him coming in. So there's other weird edits going on. It's not just a simple change of grammar as. Uh, as Richard Balcom would have us think. And there's others. Um, so, I was not convinced of the inclusio device in chapter 6, but Balcom is using it as a springboard to go into this grammar technique, which I'm, I'm, I'm also not convinced by. It's just a simple changing of the pronoun from 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 third person to first person, and he's placing a great amount of emphasis on it. It 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 even applying some kind of grammar rule to it, like a plural to singular uh, device um, that other that the uh, parallel accounts are are correcting, which it, which I think I've demonstrated they really don't, except for maybe one case. Um, even including something like that just doesn't make it plausible in in my opinion but richard balcom does bring the inclusio device back uh he i i wasn't convinced by it in chapter six but he brings it back in chapter seven to say that around these areas where the in the gospel of mark where the plural to singular grammatical devices used, the evangelist Mark highlights those areas of the text by putting it in close proximity to references to Peter. In fact, where Peter is mentioned uh, before and after those grammatical devices forms another inclusio uh, by which the author uh, of the Gospel of Mark means to demonstrate that or to highlight that the evangelist or the Apostle Peter is the source of eyewitness testimony. Here's what he says on page 161. Uh, Though used sporadically in, in the intervening narrative rather than at every point, the plural to singular narrative device therefore seems to be used very deliberately by Mark to make the perspective it gives readers the predominant, though not the only one, through the gospel story of Jesus' ministry. This inclusio design parallels closely, therefore, the inclusio formed by the references to Peter. The first double reference to Peter is followed very soon by the first use of the plural to singular narrative device and the next pair of references to Peter coincide with the second occurrence of the plural to singular narrative device 
etc., etc. You get the idea what Balcom is driving at. That's from page 161. You get the idea of what he's driving at. He's saying that where the where um, this narrative device that Balcom uh, identifies of the plural to singular pronoun or uh, pronouns, where this narrative device occurs in the Gospel of Mark, what do you know? It's bracketed by lots of names of the uh, Apostle Peter, which forms an inclusio, <laughs> a highlighting of who the uh, source of uh, testimony is. Again, uh, there's there's no reason to think this, that an inclusio means that the evangelist is pointing to uh, using the inclusio to uh, indicate who the source of eyewitness testimony is. There's no reason to think this other than Balcom has made up this rule that this is the case. There, the other thing I'd like to add, emphasizes that in chapter 6, when Richard Balcom first started discussing the inclusio of uh, eyewitness testimony, he used it by looking at the Apostle Peter at the in his first and last mention in the Gospel of Mark. How, and how in both cases, in the first and the last mention, according to Richard Balcom at least, it was written in such a way that made the name of Simon Peter stand out. He was either mentioned twice or, you know, some special emphasis was given to him. Now, when we get to chapter 7, and Richard Balcom is just any mention of Peter at all, boom, inclusio device. Yeah, <laughs> his, his standards for inclusio have, have suddenly vanished. And any mention of all at Peter uh, good enough, inclusio. Um, and, and, you know, how many times is Peter mentioned in the uh, Gospel of Mark? Um, well, he's got another table at the end of chapter 7. And, uh, he, yeah, Peter's mentioned quite a few times. Uh, <laughs> but whatever. It's, uh, it, it, they're all brackets. They're all inclusios now. And they all surround this plural to singular narrative device. Um, boy. So Richard Balcom, uh, not really following his own rules. So I'll, I'll go ahead and conclude this uh, uh, with one more quote from Richard Balcom from page 162. <clears throat> the perspective provided by the plural to singular narrative device is not simply from within the company of Jesus' disciples, but more precisely from within the inner group of Jesus' closest disciples. Then its correlation with the references to Peter is readily explicable. Well, you know, if, if you say so, Richard Balcom, it's wholly arbitrary. This inclusio device, this plural to singular narrative structure, structure where you just arbitrarily change them to we and then make we, well, really it means I, meaning Peter is representing all of the disciples. Wholly arbitrary. You can do this with any text. You can do this with the Book of Mormon. It, it, it's not a big deal. So I, I am, I, I really am unconvinced uh, by pretty much everything in chapter 7. Um, but that's stop, not stopping Richard Balcom. I'm going to read one more quote from him. I'm not, I, it's a lengthy quote. I'm not going to type it on the screen, but I'm just going to read it and uh, wrap up the the, uh, the discussion of chapter 7 with this. This is from page 172 of uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. With regard to Mark's sources, the evidence is, at the very least, consistent with, and most highly supportive of, the hypothesis that Mark's main source was the body of traditions first formulated in Jerusalem by the Twelve but that he knew this body of traditions in the form in which Peter related them. This is the conclusion that Balcom comes up with. Balcom continues, We can hardly expect to be able to distinguish features peculiar to Peter's version of these traditions, since he was doubtless already prominent in the traditions as the twelve told them. But we should raise at this point an objection to, 
which has often been made to the hypothesis that Peter's preaching stands behind Mark's gospel. So, uh, uh oh, Richard Balcom's going to get a, you know, bring him in some critical objections. Uh, Balcom continues. Why then do we not find much more in the way of personal reminiscences of Peter in the gospel? Does not the way in which Peter, despite being so prominent in the gospel, is always aligned with the other disciples, never alone with Jesus, and only rarely addressed individually by Jesus, tell against the claim that Peter himself was the source of Petrine material? Well, I would also add the fact that the evangelist Mark never identifies Peter as the source of eyewitness. I think that is probably the main objection I have to it. But regardless, uh, uh, Richard Balcom uh, answers this uh, critical objection in this way. At least part of the answer to this objection entails asking what kind of personal reminiscences we should expect Mark to have heard from Peter. You know, when I read this, this always reminds me of, um, you know, looking at, at nature and saying, I don't see any evidence of God. And then uh, the objection being, well, what kind of evidence would you expect God to place? <laughs> you know, look, here, here's the kind of evidence I would expect. I would expect the Gospel of Mark to either make an explicit reference to its eyewitness sources, which other contemporary uh, historical uh, writings of the time did do, so that shouldn't be a problem. It's not out of out of ordinary. Uh, it, it is in the style of literary uh, historical writings of the day to identify sources of information. I would expect the evangelist Mark to do the same. Why not? If it's so important to his audience, as Richard Balcom claims it is, why wouldn't he do this? Why do we have to spend chapter upon chapter of inventing or, or, or fishing out, you know, literary techniques and, and, and clunky grammar of being used as cipher codes to identify its source of eyewitness testimony? The evangelist Mark could just so easily name its source as the Apostle Peter. Boom. Done. And, and that would be it. End of story. Uh, at least for somebody who is reading the Bible as history. So the fact that that is not in there, uh, uh, huge red flags. And if Balcom's going to ask me what I would expect, that's what I would expect. And I don't see why that would be unreasonable to ask. I don't see why that is unreasonable evidence to expect. It's just preposterous. Okay, I'm done with chapter seven. Um, it It's, I think with chapter eight, Chapter eight is uh, the uh, is the Bible's version of the witness protection program. We're going to talk about uh, um, <laughs> more of the Gospel of Mark. We're going to talk about its anonymous characters. So uh, that should be fun. Uh, I'm probably back down to below 100 subscribers by this point, so I better end. And with that, I will talk to you soon. Take care.